Ja, yeah. sorry. Um, and today's topic is high on the green agenda in many countries, from corporate to SMEs to startup, but also the consumers are taking an increasing interest in plant-based and alternative proteins. And actually, in a small scale, we can see this too at this uh, workshop, because it sets an, a record of all our online activities. More than 390 have signed up and from 30 countries. And it's no wonder because alternative proteins represent not only an ideal answer to main, the main global food challenges such as nutrition, health, climate changes, biodiversity, sustainability, and food security, but it also offers a huge potential for development. So at this workshop, we will not only focus on the producer and their products, but we will also start with a super interesting presentation by Marija Banovic, a professor at the Aarhus University. She will give us an insight into the consumer behaviors towards plant-based products and alternative protein. Is that gonna be the new normal? So listen on. So following Banovic, uh, we are pleased to present to you several European and Asian SMEs, which will showcase innovative solution applied to the food industry. They will show how new ingredients are the source of innovation, giving the consumers a new take on meat, egg, dairy products. And from Japan, we will learn about Okara and later hear about the sprouted black flax sheet. Is that the new superfood? Listen on. So you are in for a very intense and interesting morning ahead of us. But the usual, we just have to introduce ourselves. Um, my name is Susanna, and I work at the Food and Bio Cluster Denmark, and together with Elise from Vitagora, uh, a French uh, food cluster, we are organizing this event. And for you who has participated in other of our global food share activities, you may know and be familiar with the project Global Future. Okay, next one. Uh, so, yes, so the Global Future project is an EU funded uh, project and uh, it uh, is actually a collaboration of seven leading European clusters and partners from Asia, from Singapore, from Thailand, from South Korea, and from Japan. So the whole aim is to stimulate innovative collaboration between European SMEs and Asian organization. But the overall aim is to boost the sustainable transition of the food system worldwide through collaboration and innovation. And as you can see, there are several uh, activities in this project. You have maybe experienced some of our online workshop uh, we have had already this is number seven and we have matchmaking on the program training programs on the four countries in asia and also international missions in may the next uh, mission will or the first mission will go to thailand and the next will be in the autumn to singapore the overall themes of this project as you can see below uh, are these and Alternative protein is the focus today. So just a brief look at the program. Yep, here we go. Um, you already have it, hopefully, but uh, here you can have a close look at uh, all the exciting uh, and super interesting uh, presentation that you will experience today. And uh, let me just introduce the first speaker, Marja Banovic, Assistant Professor at the MAP Center at August University. She's doing extensive research into consumer behaviors and the university is participating in several international projects. So please, Marja, give us an insight into the, whether the consumers are acting as they're talking. Is the plant based the new normal? So, Please, Madia, the floor is yours. Thank you, Susanna. I think uh, we are all here to discuss this really interesting conundrum. Huh? Is kind of one day the new normal, or we have some other market disruptors that 
will actually be quite big competitors to the plant-based, to the PBAs as we know it. So uh, I will first kind of introduce um, uh, why, and I already saw some of the slides, if I can, can I, next slide? I think I cannot, ah, good. Um, so, so why uh, finding these new sources, these alternative proteins is actually important. Huh? So if you look at the, the, the food sector is going through all these tribulations and we are know that all these new things and all these new innovations are actually producing this disruption on the market. So we need new food to feed all of these people that we have on the planet, but also uh, we know that the agricultural land per capita is decreasing. When we are looking at the consumer, and, and what uh, Susanne just said is quite interesting that what people do and uh, what they say and what they do, that's kind of there is a, this quite a big gap in between. So what we can see that in the past years, these trends uh, in terms of the animal-based products are increasing. Huh? And when we are looking at the consumer studies, uh, we see that all the consumers, uh, especially in Europe, are saying, well, we are quite aware of these climate challenges and so on, and we are trying to have an, a positive impact. But then when we are looking at the data, uh, kind of macro data, what will happen, for example, with the meat consumption in future until 2030, what we are witnessing is exactly that these actually <laughs> cycles will increase. So we have this quite big intention behavior gap of what people say and what people do. Um, so how do we make room huh, for all these new uh, proteins, new products, new ingredients? So um, if we uh, look at the, the, the extensive research that has been done on, first of all, PBAs, but I will talk a little bit on the other uh, product categories that I think will also produce, be competitors to the PBAs, but also pr uh, already producing the disruption on the market. If you look at the plant-based foods, uh, what we know already that they're easily acceptable by the consumer because of their, let's say, uh, inherent healthy nature uh, that uh, are seen by the consumer. They're easy to understand, easy to check, and so on. However, we have some drawbacks that you all know, and the, the following speakers will probably talk about that. First of all, the, the problem with the taste that is now much better and improving in the recent years. Uh, but also the overprocessing nature, and then I will talk uh, shortly about that. Uh, as an answer to the PBAs we, we had on the market, we have on the market hybrid or these blended products uh, that came as an answer to this kind of, uh, uh, let's say, meat lovers' uh, need for more tasty, pleasurable, pleasurable experience with the with the with the animals, and then. We also have the cell-based foods like cultured foods, cultured meat, cultured dairy that are appearing and also precision fermentation where uh, the, with the cell-based foods, the, the most, uh, let's say the, the, the biggest drawback that we are seeing right now is um, the problem with the techs. So with the using microbes and so on to produce uh, the food. So, um, if I look at the market, uh, I will just give you a short uh, here. This is from the Mintel database. What we can see, we had a big increase in PBAs, both uh, meat and dairy substitutes since their in introduction. But what we are witnessing in the, in the last year and the past years, we, we are witnessing some stagnation on the market. And if you look at the, the, the recent report from Deloitte, we can see that um, uh, what they found is that consumers and starting to be uh, questioning, uh, uh, first of all, the healthiness, sustainability of, of, the, of the PBAs. And due to the inflation that we have in, in, in Europe, they are not so willing to, to pay the premium for the, for the PBAs. Uh, of course, we have some improvements, of course, on the, on the, on the taste and then the nutrition side. So, um, if we are if we are thinking, so we have all these new innovation, huh? all these new ideas, new, but we have all these. Uh, I always say this success paradox here, uh, and there is this. Uh, all you, you probably know this famous uh, famous movie, Field of Dreams. Huh? If I build it, they will come. So we, uh, what we can see, uh, all of us who dive in the behavioral science, we know that it's not enough that we have just new innovation, new technologies. And so it's necessary, but it's not sufficient. We have to have also 
uh, to prioritize marketing and uh, would go to market strategy and to, to have the success in the marketplace. Um, what we are witnessing is that the, 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 the market now with PBAs is quite saturated and they are sold more as a commodity than um, they are not so much differentiated, they are not positioned in the right way, which kind of produces the challenges uh, for the consumers and even the consumers who intend to, to, to reduce their meat and their consumption, they often are not willing to compromise on the other aspects. Huh? So again, we have this quite a big gap. So how we can go about it? So in my mind, there are these like several areas that we need to tackle and I will go through all of them. Uh, first of all, uh, when we talk about uh, these new, and I'm not talking only, only about PBAs, but including the other uh, uh, products that will come from precision fermentation, from uh, 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 cell-based foods, cultured uh, meat, and so on. Uh, what we can see here that first of all, um, that we need to consider that uh, they can have a great impact and great return, huh? but um, we need to uh, be aware how to position these products, how to differentiate them on the market in a proper way. The first thing that we need to consider is first that our success huh, of our product it depends also going a little bit beyond the competition. Huh? It's not only about mimicking what is already there on the market. If we have a great product, we, we should sell it as it is. Huh? And I will talk about that. The second thing, we need to orchestrate this integrated consumer experience. So connect it to the consumer, to, to their lifestyle choices, their needs, values, and so on. Uh, most importantly, <laughs> in talking about the gap I just mentioned and, and the challenges that we are witnessing is that it takes a lot of time also to change the consumer habits. Huh? So if we want to have kind of a bigger impact on the market, we need to be aware how we can actually make the consumer adopt our product. Huh? It's not only about the intention and the acceptance. And finally, having more holistic approach, using all this information in a proper way when we provide a narrative story when you commu communicate about our product. Okay, so uh, the first thing I mentioned, so the, the, the success, um, uh, uh, as I said, if you have a great product, why do we need to mimic, uh, uh, let's say meat product of the, the dairy? Huh? So in this study, what we were looking at is, is mimicking actually uh, detrimental? Is it kind of holding us back uh, from, from uh, achieving what we want, uh, this adoption from the consumer? And uh, we have very good examples now on the market from Natuli, don't call me milk. Huh? That's really good. I loved it when I saw it. And what, uh, that's exactly what we found in our study, that this similarity, uh, calling something uh, analog or a substitute is actually inducing negative uh, consumer perceptions. And often uh, then that induces the, the, the other uh, and <laughs> like seeing these products as overprocessed. What we saw that can help uh, kind of reduce this negative impact is the ingredient and the fit of the ingredient with the product that was chosen uh, as a carrier for the ingredient. And improving the tech and the ingredients we see that can have in the future quite great impact on the market. And then um, another thing coming back to when I said positioning and differentiation, what I'm seeing kind of most of the product, uh, product that we have on the market, we have talking about what products, uh, what attributes product have. And it's usually about taste, about price, about convenience and so on. That's, that's true, yeah. And if, we, if you look on the, on the left-hand side, we, we did this study in several, in three countries. And yes, we proved that, yeah, the sensory perception and all the other things, yes, they influence the intention uh, to buy uh, these analogs. In this case, it was a hybrid product, but, what we found out, if I go just a little bit beyond and provide a proper narrative and say, okay, what this product actually promises, but I don't specify. So I'm going a little bit, uh, uh, trying to induce this um, more observable benefit that the consumer, uh, that product have for the consumer, that will induce even higher acceptance for the consumer. And we, uh, we, uh, this was done through an experimental study. So what we found out, depending, fitting the consumer, uh, the target segment of the consumer with their self-interest of self, their standard goals, so kind of having healthier or a more environmental look into the product could 
uh, help uh, acceptance of the product. Okay, and then uh, I'm, uh, I, uh, oopsie, so I think I pressed it too much. Yes, and then um, when we talk about uh, orchestrating the inter integrated uh, consumer experience. So kind of making it more visual. We already said it's it's nothing harder than making consumer to try something new. Huh? Why would they try something new? If you have increase in income and so on, they will first, the aspirational thing are these traditional cultural things. And we need to <laughs> let fight against that. Huh? So that's uh, one of the things that, uh, that we uh, tackled in this, um, in these two studies, we uh, combine the sensory experiments with some uh, narratives and so on. And what we found out is that making it visual, making it more connected to the lifestyle choices that the consumers have can actually help the adoption of the product. Of course, the sensory part matters, but even more during the, because we did the experiments even before, after, and during the consumption, what we saw that uh, even providing the information after the consumption could actually help the adoption of this product. Okay. And then if it moves, yes. And then, um, uh, yes. Um, so we often hear when we talk about um, PBAs and other analogs um, that uh, for success, as I said before, uh, we need to have a good taste, good sensory experience, uh, convenience, and so on. But uh, when we, what we try to tackle in this study, and what we know, uh, that is all true, but while eating food, it's not only about um, eating per se, it's not about the information, it's also a matter of emotions. Eh? So um, uh, that also arises from how we feel about the product, how we feel about some context within which uh, product is eaten and so on. So uh, consumers, what we see, as I mentioned in the previous slide, um, they often forget the information that we gave them at the, at the purchase point. So it's it's really important that this kind of emotional part is also tackled. Huh? And then we can also maybe provide the information after how to use this product, how to dispose and so on. In this study, we do, did actually that. We wanted to see um, providing uh, images uh, that can excite the consumer uh, and how would that then uh, finally influence their acceptance of the product? What we found out, if we match uh, the, 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 the right images to the right product and increase the excitement levels, that will, of course, increase the acceptance. Of course, he, we didn't have here the sensory trials, but at least uh, we managed to, to increase their attitudes and intentions towards products. And then... Uh, I will uh, just mention uh, again uh, this problem that we have often with the adoption and the price. <laughs> we did a big study across, uh, again, three countries in Denmark, Spain, and UK. We wanted to see, and okay, now if I um, want to increase uh, the willingness to pay for the, in this case, uh, we had a hybrid product, uh, what we provided them, different information and see which of these informations could help uh, increase the willingness to pay for, for these particular products. What we found out, for example, that in Spain and UK, convenience worked really well in connection with the price, but in Denmark, it didn't matter what type of information, it was more um, uh, in the line in our, uh, with our previous studies, uh, was helping if we, we were matching the correct consumer segment with the, with the information. And then I would just mention a little bit um, uh, about, um, uh, let's say, uh, going further on in the adoption. When we talk about the adoption of the, of the, of the product, we often say, use this kind of total product concept. Uh, there, first of all, when I'm creating a new product, I have to uh, think about what is the relative advantage. So going again, going back to what I was saying before, what is my advantage against my competitors? Uh, I don't want to mimic them. I want to have a product that is kind of standing on its own. What is the compatibility? So going back to linking to all the slides, what is the compatibility with, with needs, values, with the current trends that are existing on the market? How complex is my product? That's often something that is forgotten. We have a great product and then we don't explain how this product should be used or even the packaging, and then, then <laughs> we have a failure of the product because people, it's not because the product is not good, but simply they don't know how to use it. 
Finally, how, uh, when the product should be used? Can I use it at work? Can I just sit here in front of the computer or I can eat it at home in a social context? So, uh, and finally, how observable all these information is, and going beyond, remember when I was talking about positioning differentiation, going beyond, what are the benefits that I can invoke and how observable they are uh, to the consumer? In this study, we were actually looking at all these things and, and, and we found three distinct things that can kind of be a negative, have a negative Im impact on the perception of, of the products, uh, positive, and then the kind of, that we're not sure about it. So the first one, first one that we all see and across all these uh, categories is first of all, unfamiliarity. Huh? So making more familiar, uh, linking to the products that they already, um, uh, let's say technologies or something that they know already could help huh? because that uncertainty can invoke some negative, um, uh, uh, let's say negative influence on the, on the, on their perceptions, invoking um, things like uh, having healthy ingredients, good flavor, naturally still still something to go on. Finally, the transparency that's something that consumers is always asking um, to have more trustworthy uh, source and to be more open about the production process. And then uh, I will um, uh, quickly finish up. Uh, Okay, so so how then uh, at the end we <laughs> we should use all this information to kind of to 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 drive the performance. So as I mentioned before, we have now these cell-based foods. Uh, I worked on one of the projects on precision fermentation. I give you here example of uh, milk and marble because I saw that many of you will talk about uh, uh, meat uh, uh, analogs, but there is also um, re-milk. We have the dairy. Uh, analogs. Uh, what we did in this study, we didn't have um, analogs to dairy and, 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 and meat. We actually produced the sweet protein, so kind of to substitute sugar, but the technology in itself was same. What we found out is that uh, before I even go into the acceptance of the ingredients and, and the products, the technology could be something that is a drop, uh, that could kind of produce uh, a negative impact on the on the acceptance. What we saw that uh, the, the, the recent movements uh, from non-GMO organizations talking about precision fermentation and so on can <laughs> provoke quite a negative influence on the, on the acceptance of this technology. However, in this study, what we have done, we wanted to contradict that and say, well, okay, uh, this type of technology uh, it's, it's something similar. It's already existent. Huh? We are producing something like bread and beer and so on. And, and uh, um, uh, these technologies are quite similar. And we are already producing vitamins and insulin and so on. Uh, what happened there that we actually managed to contra contradict all these neophobia, uh, fear, skepticism towards the technology and increase uh, more uh, acceptance and perceived benefits of the of the of the technology, and finally then the products. Uh, and we managed to actually override using simple heuristics to override the 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 messages that were used uh, for this technology. And finally, we did another study um, uh, uh, on cultured meat. Uh, we were looking at the different uh, again uh, segments of the consumers. Uh, what we wanted to see here is, again, what could be the narrative, because the most important thing I can have, as I said, a great product, but then um, we need to eliminate a chance that the, this product is misunderstood. Huh? So uh, we looked at the different types of framing and especially the, the, the toughest crowd, <laughs> the, the meat lover crowd, who are uh, quite difficult to, to adopt all these new products. And what we found out that using more positive framing, explaining what are the benefits uh, evoking pleasure and so on, the contextual cues during the consumption actually helped to, um, to accept uh, the cultured meat uh, better. And I will finish, I think I'm on time, uh, <laughs> one minute. So, so um, uh, what I would like to say, so there are still um, some issues. We know that this disruption with all these products, especially now with the Cell-based food is is quite is coming. Huh? It's here. It's already here, and we already have uh, um, uh, like upside food, uh, just eat uh, chicken and so on on the market. Uh, Re-milk. Um, 
and, and we need what I can see, we need to seize the moment. And how do we seize the moment is um, we also need to think about that uh, our food system <laughs> is still uh, quite linear. So, uh, and we have lots of problems in Europe uh, with the regulations of these novel foods. Um, and that could be something that could hamper, uh, let's say, uh, introduction of, of many of these products uh, in the market. And we already know, for example, for the precision fermentation, there is a food fermentation uh, uh, the Europe alliance uh, that are pushing some of the re regulation, not even to talk about uh, cultured meat and, and, and amosa meat has issues, for example, with, with uh, some of the regulation. So what we need to, um, uh, as I said, we need to seize the moment. And these are here, I will stop now. <laughs> these are some of the things that we um, need to consider when talking about PBAs. Overprocessing is something that consumer doesn't like. Uh, texture and taste is improved. What you need to consider, don't always take the, in, to rely on the personal values and the trends that are existent. They change. <laughs> we, we witness that. What is important to learn from the stories that are already uh, successful, like amplify taste tests from PepsiCo or make a story about your technology and ingredients that can help um, the adoption of, of, of your products. Thank you. And if anything you have on the next slide, if it goes through, you have all the projects that I talked about. I don't know, it doesn't want to go. Um, and yeah, and the links there so you can use them. Elisa, I didn't manage to press the next. I don't know why. Yeah. Yeah, it's, it's, it's here. It should be here. <laughs> Thank you all. Great. Uh, thanks a lot, Maria, for these uh, helpful uh, insights on what consumers think uh, about alternative proteins. Uh, yeah, uh, on our side, it's very interesting to see how breath perceptions of the products is much more complex than we, we, we might think. Uh, and yeah, there are a lot of different parameters we should consider uh, regarding uh, this uh, consumer perception. So thank, thanks a lot for your, uh, your presentation. Thank you. Um, before to continue with our brilliant uh, other speakers, uh, we will have a little poll. Uh, so I'm letting my uh, partner, uh, Ellie uh, from FBCD, to introduce this poll to you. Thank you so much, Elise. So what we're going to do now is, uh, uh, Maritza also spoke so much about experiments. So we're going to make a small experiment here with uh, you guys. It's just a quick question for you to answer. Uh, do you currently work with plant-based proteins in your company? It's a yes, no question. So it should be fairly easy for you guys to answer. Um, it's also just to get a under better understanding of who is joining us here um, today. Uh, Yes, and I can see a lot of answers are coming in. So great job, you are awake out there uh, in the world. All right, let's have a look at the, the results. If uh, you see here, actually majority of you, almost 70% work with plant-based proteins already today, and then we have 30% who does not work with plant-based proteins. I think this gives us a, a great opportunity uh, for the rest of the presentations today to get inspiration. Uh, to maybe do further development for those of you already working in this field or new business opportunities for those of you not working with plant-based proteins today. Yeah, so that was a small poll and thank you all for uh, participating. And now uh, Elise will continue with introducing the speakers. Yeah, great. Thanks a lot, Ellie, um, for this uh, little uh, interesting uh, so now we will go um, for the first uh, masterclass, uh, which is about uh, finished uh, finished product, uh, alternative to meat, alternative to fish, alternative to dairy product too. So we will saw all these uh, plant based uh, company um, during this masterclass. Um, and for to begin, I will uh, introduce to you. Uh, Sonion Park, um, who is uh, working uh, at Footpolis, Food our partner uh, in South Korea. So Sonion, the, the floor is yours uh, if you want to present your, your company. Thank you, Elise. Good afternoon for people who are joining in Asia. 
and good morning for the folks in Europe. Food Polis is the official partner of Global Future Project, and we are excited to introduce two Korean companies today. The first speaker will be Mr. Yongmin Lee, COO of Devotion Food, and I will shortly introduce the next speaker after Ten Two's presentation. So Devotion Food is a plant-based minced meat alternative company who moves towards carbon neutrality and creates sustainable value in the food industry. Devotion Food's main inventions are Devotion Meat and Veggie Spot, which is Korea's first marbling added plant-based meat product. The umami flavor with low sodium and calories provides a healthy, delicious vegan experience. Mr. Lee, the floor is yours. Please proceed. Hello. Uh, hello, my name is Yong Lee and I'm CEO of the Devotion Foods and also the co-founder of Devotion Foods. Our Devotion Foods literally started with a mindset of dedication and mindset of delivering healthy alternative meat to consumers. The following index is by product introduction, company introduction to certificates and press. As you all know, uh, there are multiple companies that are now in the alternative market. So this tiger might help you to understand better about it. So there are various type of alternative meat. They are um, TSP, TVP, HMMA, uh, insect meat to cultured meat. Uh, for this diagram, we uh, there are like many uh, people that doesn't know about um, the plant-based meat and what is like different between cultured and insect and like uh, plant-based meats. Uh, TSP is mainly made from soybean protein only and is usually used in dry form such as uh, ISP powder, flake and granotypes. And TVP is um, based on uh, soy protein, pea protein, and other granule type, uh, other um, oats uh, and extra. And made up for shortcomings of TSP by using various main ingredients such as um, soybean. And HMMA is a product with high moisture content and is not dried after being used, uh, subjected to secondary molding after extruding, as in case of manufacturing TSP and TVP. As a feature in process of real, realizing uh, fibers during secondary molding, a texture similar to that of chicken is created. And for the insect meat, uh, it uses silkworm and grasshoppers as a raw material. And lastly, in the case of cultured meat, it is known as stem cells are corrected from animal and cultured. Then uh, I will briefly introduce the substitute meat of our intuition foods. Uh, first of all, there are four characteristics of our Devotion Foods product. Uh, it's lower on uh, calories and sodium, and it's got upgraded plant-based flavor, and it's also cholesterol and gluten-free. And thirdly, improvement of three objects to all soy-based meat. And lastly, we're acting environment and social. Um, when Devotion Food was first developed as an alternative meat, the alternative meat, the meat market was in its fancy. Um, and as a result of market research, we learned about several other alternative meat companies. And substitute meat is actually not as uh, healthy as we thought. 
Yeah. The graph on the left is um, our diversion foods um, eat, and on the right side, uh, it's the ordinary uh, plant-based meat. So for the problem was that the um, ordinary plant-based meat was not focused on consumers' health, so we felt uh, it wasn't enough. So most of the product is introduced on the market contribute to in environmental protection due to problems of uh, substitute meat, calorie and sodium level and gluten. So we thought it should be, uh, our product should be a healthier and uh, healthier as well. Uh, these are diversion foods technology that are different from others. If you look at closely at the picture, you can find the white spot that looks like a fat. It, that is 100% vegetable fat that is cholesterol-free. And not only that, if you cook the uh, cooked diversion meat, you can find the fat does not flow all the way, not all the way, 100%. And it's like a, a fat on the meat. It sticks to the meat and it has the texture and the aroma with the meat. So we call this as a capsulation. We create the pocket in the fat uh, we mixed with the aroma and the flavor and it sticks to the meat. For the texture, texture was one of our most uh, prior tasks for diversion foods because the first bite decides people to eat or more, eat more or not about the meat. To describe meat texture protein was not enough for a customer to think that it's similar to meat. So we created plant-based binder to feed the customer them that it, it is like a multiple labor, layers of fiber, protein and similar to the meat. Uh, and we used the metacellulars to make a binder and algin and other seaweeds. With these outcomes from our research, um, we've conducted a consumer satisfaction survey between all soy-based meat and the result was quite satisfied. Um, these are our diversion foods product. We have um, diversion meat, meat, which is like a meat that has no flavor, like plain meat. And we have other seasoned product, which is um, bulgogi flavor, herb salt flavor, plant taco. Um, it's, it's all Korean based um, seasoning and flavors. And these are our dumplings and um, stir fry rice and uh, hamburger steak, which is for um, HMR products. This graph shows that use of plastic is going up every year. So we thought our product is to save the plant uh, why, why don't we use the package to do, to do the same work? Um, so we, we are actually using FSC papers and soy inks uh, to save our planet. Um, right now we are running our uh, manufacturing system in Nunsong and we have our own uh, business office and so uh, for our um, 
production uh, production facilities. Uh, we are actually uh, making our ingredients and our outcome products uh, in Umsung factory, and these are our uh, kappa. And these are our uh, patents to secure our technology and we are looking to apply more this year. And we actually applied uh, for more uh, for our binders and um, our new technologies. And these are our um, awards, and uh, we received the uh, HACCP, ISO, FDA, HALAR uh, certificates from for our products and our factory. Uh, we actually started our business in USA, Chicago, with um, CEO Council Park in 2017. And, you know, we started in small kitchen as a chef and we came all the way this, we came all the way to series A round and now we are running business in Korea. And for our, uh, Plant-based meat in Korea. We actually are we are nominated from Forbes best thirty under thirty in Asia. Um, founder and I started as a chef in Michelin star restaurants. Our dream was to make our customers to enjoy the meal and eat healthy one. Devotion foods will become a healthy choice for uh, we who make a better world. Um, thank you for listening and I'm finished. Thank you very much, um, Mr. Lee. Uh, yeah, indeed, that, that's great. Uh, how you used uh, the old objections uh, about aroma, texture, and flavor to improve your product. So yeah, it's always a bit challenging uh, regarding plant-based disease parameters. So thanks for your presentation. Thank you. Elise, can I just, uh, we have, just one question in the Q&A, uh, maybe we can uh, kind of, uh, what is the shelf life outside the cooler and freezer from one of our participants? I'd like to know this. Um, what was the question again? What is the shelf life in and outside the cooler and freezer? You know, when you have the meat, uh, what is the shelf life? How long can it last? Um, for a freezer, we're uh, taking one year, and for out of the freezer, um, we're actually looking at uh, 28 days. All right. I hope this answers the question. And also, another one, and that's it, then we continue. Does the production volume, how much is it in, in kilo? Do you have a... a kilo, we're actually doing um, two, two to three tons so which is um uh, 30 30 um 100 kilos per day wow okay uh Lise, back to you <laughs> thank you very much for the answers so um now we will go uh from alternative to meat to alternative to fish um, and I will uh, let uh, Charles Fouquet 
uh, and Amelie Catlow, uh, CEO and R&D uh, Director uh, of Onami Foods, uh, French company. Uh, I will let them present uh, their, their company. So, um, Amelie, do I uh, give you the control to you for moving the slide? Yeah. Sorry, you can give it to Charles because you okay. will start. <laughs> Okay, so Charles, uh, you have the control and both of you, the floor is yours. I hope. Good morning, everyone. Uh, thank you very much uh, for welcoming us uh, and present a little bit of Onami Foods, our, our French startup that is uh, doing, as you can see, uh, a lot to do with sea products. I'm very impressed with uh, all the presentations so far, so I hope you would also appreciate uh, ours. So uh, our motto is embrace the wave, the, the wave of change and the wave of, uh, of plant-based food and seafood for us. Let me see if I have control. No, really, yes. Uh, ah, yeah, okay, it's with my pad. Oh. There is a, a lot of delay. I don't have control now. It's not our presentation anymore. Elise? Yeah, yeah, let me just, uh, yeah. Yeah, so the presentation is really big. That's why there is some, some delay. It might be better if you turn the slides because uh, okay. there's a lagging between uh, your server and, our, and my laptop. So uh, I'm not sure it's uh, convenient. Okay, if you want, just tell me when, uh, when I have to. Okay, to let's, let's turn to the next slide. Thank you, Elise. So Onami Foods, uh, Onami meaning the big wave in, in Japanese is very meaningful to what we do, uh, which is alternative seafood and uh, hopefully delicious. Uh, we design our products based from algae and plants to, to really try to revolutionize the consumer behavior and, and make him uh, uh, an adept or a future adept of uh, plant-based and algae-based products. Thank you. Next slide. Uh, what we are aiming is to uh, replace or at least give an alternative to the traditional industrial uh, seafood industry, uh, as I mentioned, uh, with a base of algae and plants uh, to make a various range uh, of uh, seafood products uh, from coated products uh, to uh, shredded uh, and cooked meals and try to uh, preserve and maybe save a little bit our planet. We are indeed aligned with uh, uh, UN Sustainable Goals 12, 13, and 14, most importantly, uh, aiming for a better life on, on the water and uh, climate action. You can turn the slide, thank you. Uh, this is the core team. Uh, and the three co-founders, I have to, uh, to also put Emily, who was with us uh, from day one, and Benjamin and myself, uh, who... Uh, had the idea in a nutshell, and then we developed the whole project with Amélie, Marion, and Tristan as a IT development. Next slide. Uh, I am going to cover a little bit the market perspective, while Amélie will be uh, going uh, more on the product uh, 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 details. So uh, let's see a little bit how uh, our uh, our market uh, is uh, is reacting. So. This is a very simple uh, uh, problem solution or situation in action uh, slide. So we know that the oceans are, are in suffering. Uh, there is uh, uh, problems like uh, overfishing, uh, microplastic pollution that is coming from our consumption, but also pollution due to the fishing industry, ghost nets uh, and other uh, um, trash that is thrown into the sea. And another problem linked to, to massive uh, industrial fishing is bycatch, uh, whereby bottom trawlers uh, catch uh, not only the, the fish they're aiming for, but everything around, uh, and, and that is also hurting our oceans. So there is a, a real problem under the surface of the water, as much as there is one in, in uh, intensive uh, agriculture above the water. And we know uh, for a couple of years now that uh, the market is evolving and that we have uh, an emerging flexitarian population. In Europe, uh, we will see on the next slide, there is uh, already several markets that are more mature than in France, but we have um, 
really uh, a change that is happening. And and where Onami makes a difference when I uh, um, add up all the figures of the previous slide is that actually for one kilo of Onami products uh, that is consumed, we are close to two kilo of fish, 1.75 that are saved. Uh, you bring this to a, a global scale of 190 million tons of seafood produced every year. Each 1% of change is 3 million tons of fish saved. So every, uh, every bite uh, can make a difference. Every product that comes on the market, not only Onami, uh, will make a difference to preserve uh, life on the water. You can go to the next slide. Uh, I was mentioning bottom trawling, um, which has, uh, of course, an impact on, on the biodiversity, but uh, less is said about uh, carbon impact on the water. We, of course, know that uh, intensive uh, beef um, uh, meat uh, producers are uh, having a heavy impact in terms of CO2. Uh, I, on this uh, graph, it's at 40 kilo for each, 40 kilo of CO2 for each a kilo of meat produced. Uh, some graphs even show double this figure. Uh, but when we come down to seafood products as salmon and shrimps, we see that there is a similar level um, in terms of, of, um, of production compared to, to let's say, a chicken. Uh, so definitely uh, aquaculture and, uh, and intensive uh, shrimp culture are also problematic. And the last arrow shows actually zero or close to zero. That's the impact simply of, uh, of uh, growing a chickpea uh, or producing a, a plant-based alternative. Uh, and when we go on the fishing side on the right, you see a, a nice little uh, a net uh, on the bottom of the sea. There is actually a Japanese uh, uh, study that shows that uh, this intensive activity uh, actually uh, brings up all the, the sediments from the bottom of the sea, sediments that have sequestered uh, carbon for for thousands and millions of years, and that are also polluting in terms of CO2 uh, as much as the global air transportation activity. So definitely, uh, carbon is a is a problem to tackle above and below the water. Next slide. Um, I guess everybody uh, here in this webinar agrees to say that plant-based is the next normal, and we see that uh, the figures are growing steadily. Maybe not as fiercely as the past years, but still, uh, this uh, graph from A.T. Kearney shows uh, the global um, meat market, which is over uh, 1,000 uh, 1, billion euros a year over the, over the, the, the four decades. And we see on the left side, the plant-based uh, activity that is growing decade after decade. Uh, T. Kearney says that by uh, 2040 horizon, our market will be uh, around 400 billion uh, euros uh, from uh, barely uh, 50 to 60 billion uh, as of today. So there is definitely growth that is coming from innovation and from the many startups that are popping around the world. Thank you. Uh, and when we bring it down to uh, the European market, we can see, as I mentioned earlier, that there is two um, main uh, mature markets that are emerging, UK and Germany, in terms of size, are much bigger. Uh, and the two following ones, Netherlands and Switzerland, uh, if they are not as close as in size, the consumption per capita is also growing fast. Uh, and uh, following uh, these uh, four leaders, you have other countries that are also growing steadily. Here in France, we notice a difference. The growth of our uh, activity, plant-based activity in Europe, is not as uh, intense as it was in the past years. This graph is from 2021. Looking back, we are not at a 20% growth a year. Uh, I think we are today, uh, to my perspective, around 10%, if not just below a 10% growth for the plant-based category uh, overall. So there is still a lot of room to, uh, to, to uh, grow. Next slide. And uh, the reason why Onami uh, emerged as a plant-based seafood is we have noticed that indeed that in the plant-based meat sector, there are many actors many that uh, are still growing. Uh, there's new ones I discovered today, but already some blockbusters in the plant-based meat sector. While in the seafood, we had very little actors, uh, if not none in France. Uh, so this is the reason why um, Onami decided to engage into plant-based seafood 
being also a Brittany uh, a region uh, startup. Brittany is a, is a beautiful region of uh, French coastline. So we had access to, to seaweed over there. Next slide. So now I will let Amélie and, uh, and help Amélie through the, the presentation of, of our products uh, that are answering all those uh, problems in the market that I just uh, mentioned. Hi, everybody. So I will go shortly on what we are doing and our goals, because uh, what we want is to be uh, the European reference for quality alternative seafood. And go so to the next go slide, uh, Elise. On the... Sorry? Now you have to tell Elise uh, when, uh, when to turn ah, the okay. <laughs> <laughs> So yeah. it's just what I was saying, like uh, being a European reference for quality alternative seafood products. So if you go on the next slide, um, tomorrow the green gold is algae. So we are just at the beginning in Europe, discovering all the flavors, nutrients, what they can deliver. So we are very happy to work with that. And I think it's a great sources of uh, new innovation. Uh, if we go on the next slide. Um, today, what is it? It looks like fish. It tastes like fish, but it's not fish. So that's the aim of what we are producing. So we have three points. So distinct seafood marine flavors. Um, our recipe has a unique nutritious recipe as we are using algae and plants. We are, I think, the world number one in the world not using methyl cellulose in your products, and we have a patent pending for that. Um, so we are very happy with this recipe with very nice flavors and so on, and the best will be that you try it to discover that. Um, if we go on the next slide. Maybe, Amélie, uh, uh, I just yep. want to, to highlight uh, because, uh, as you yeah, mentioned... but we are just uh, out of time. <laughs> we are out of time. Then I, I will not uh, <laughs> continue. Go on, go on. So that's why I'm a little bit rushing. I'm sorry <laughs> for that. So um, it just what uh, it's just a general presentation anyway. So what we are creating today and what we have today, we have already six products on the market. So it's nuggets, no fish and chips like uh, products, uh, mini fillets, burgers, and what is going on in the next months weeks now it's a uh, tempura shrimp and shrimp pasta and gyoza and everything with a seafood taste so and we are like of course nutriscore b and clean label as i was saying before if you go on the next slide so what we aim is to uh, de create and do more innovation in uh, 35 npd in 2026 so in different way of products so like Shanks, sprayed, coated, uh, ready meals, and so on. Um, and to continue in your value, so same if you continue, Elise. So because we believe to to we need to save the oceans and using as less uh, plastic as possible, we having a, a packaging without uh, with nineteen percent less plastic today. Um, and after, like we have, a, if you go on the slide after, we have a mixed marketing. But I don't know if Charles, you want to go quickly with that. Oh yeah, this is ju just uh, yes, but, uh, these you can you can go on that those slides. Uh, this is just to uh, show a little bit the uh, maturity of the market. Uh, I was mentioning uh, UK, uh, Germany, and and the rest of the crowds here. In France, we are more in the very beginning of, uh, of the plant-based, uh, touching only uh, what we call the innovators, active vegans, and adventurous people who want to try over new products. And while in the other more mature markets, could it be uh, here in Europe or, or in the US, we are in between the two and the three where uh, we have adopters that are true flexitarians and, and uh, consuming regularly our products and getting close to a mass market, although there has been a little bit of setback in uh, late 2022, as we noticed, uh, uh, notably with uh, Beyond Meat, just to name one. So the market is stabilizing and in a bit uh, in a dip in between two waves right now. But still, this is the, the wave of change, let's say, put it this way. Next slide. Um, 
we are, are pushing a lot uh, since we started commercializing last April on the social medias. Uh, it's uh, it's just the beginning. We are very colorful. That's just our ad identity. If you have the chance to go on Onami uh, social network, you will see uh, it's it's quite colorful. Uh, today it's on LinkedIn, Instagram, Facebook. Soon we'll be pushing over to TikTok. Uh, but it's is a, a tool that uh, I guess many of us uh, use uh, over the over the months to, to make ourselves well known. You can go to the next slide. Uh, and of course, in order to, to make our products appealing uh, in, uh, in retail or in wholesale, so we have a uh, full uh, uh, use of, uh, of marketing. Uh, could it be in stores? Uh, as you can see with uh, tastings, which is the most important, important uh, to let our consumers taste our products. Once they taste it, usually they're quite convinced. Uh, we had some TV appearance to, uh, during those uh, events we were doing. We have some chefs that are talking about us. And uh, this year, we're going also to do some more live uh, cooking uh, around France to make our products uh, more appealing to uh, the, the French market. You can go to the next slide, Elise. There you go. So. That was Onami in a nutshell, uh, less on the technology, more on the marketing. Uh, but indeed, uh, we are developing a lot of products to be a, a reference in algae and plant-based seafood products. Thank you so much, everybody. Thank you. Thanks. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Charles. And thank you, Amy, for this uh, lovely presentation. Uh, yeah, uh, indeed, that's quite impressive how you work product from the product itself. To the packaging, uh, but also your whole strategy of a very current base baseline uh, about carbon uh, impact and biodiversity too. So yeah, thanks for sharing that with us. Um, actually, we have a question, but um, as we are a bit a bit late, <laughs> a bit out of time, uh, maybe uh, we will keep the question for for the Q and A session at the end. Uh, so uh, we will continue with uh, um, the South Korean uh, company. So uh, again, uh, Son Young, I will uh, I will give you uh, the floor, uh, and uh, you can introduce uh, the, the next uh, company. Thank you, Elise. The second Korean speaker will be Hyunseok An, CEO of WeMeet. We Meat is a mushroom-based alternative meat company. The texture of mushrooms provide a great meat-like texture to their product. We Meat Fried is their newest product, which is plant-based chicken. Both Devotion Food and We Meat has participated in food policy startup support programs. So if you are interested in joining the company support programs in South Korea, I will leave more information in the chat so we could connect later on. But for now, please give a warm welcome to Mr. Hyunseok An. Thank you. Thank you. Um, good morning, everyone, and thank you for a great introduction. Um, my name is Hyunseok. I will go by Hans, and I am the CEO of WeMeet. Um, first of all, I am honored to introduce WeMeet uh, alongside with great uh, companies to global food community here. And I'm going to talk about how we meet, um, came to life and what we have done so far. Um, through this, I hope today's talk can give you a little bit of a glimpse to what's going on in Asia, especially South Korea, in terms of uh, meat alternative development. So let me start. Um, So uh, we made as a company that develops and manufactures meat alternative, and we currently focus on creating for cut products made from mushrooms, and we are striving to envision the future of meat for the next generation. So the current uh, method of obtaining meat through the so-called um, factory farming is no longer sustainable, as you all know. So we made fundamentally innovate the food system utilizing um, the infinite possibility of nature, including plants and mushroom, instead of animals, to sustain our prosperous um, food culture. Um, let's think about this. Um, when shopping for meat at a grocery store, uh, how many of you naturally consider meat alternatives? 
Um, there, if you are a vegan or vegetarian or who are interested in vegetarian diets, you may be uh, interesting, but uh, most of people uh, may not. So there are many meat alternative on the market, but um, still those products are far from our daily lives. And there must be various reasons. Some may not be aware of these new products or have no access. Or um, one of the main reasons is actually most of existing products couldn't provide a um, positive experience. So uh, no matter how you experience this one, um, once uh, most of people um, choose again. So I started to look into how the existing products are made and I found the problem rooted in the convention of meat alternative developments. So, um, so far most of meat alternatives are made of dry TBP, a textured vegetable protein, and its main ingredient is mostly soybean, uh, which is good for health, but it has an it has its unpleasant taste and flavor and most of uh, meat alternatives are actually trying to mask or masking those on uh, taste and flavor. Um, but I think there is a limitation in this approach. And also it might be suitable for um, ground meat application, but its sponge-like texture and lack of fiber structure make it unsuitable for, for cut meats. So um, in order to overcome the limitations, some um, have focused on wet TBP, also known as uh, HMMA, high moisture meat alternative. Um, and it actually has improved texture and structure of TVP, like uh, as you can see on the slide, uh, there looks a very distinct fiber, but it still falls short of the rich taste and complex texture that we expect from real meat. So we take a different approach. Instead of using soy, we start from mushroom combined with other plant-based proteins and convert them into a whole cut product for the various applications. And why mushroom? Mushroom itself has already been widely used for meat substitutes to some extent due to its chewy texture and umami taste. Um, so we are trying to harness those properties and we have taken it a step further by incorporating mycelium into the mix, creating a mushroom mycelium complex through a fermentation process. And this results in a product with not only enhanced texture, but a truly satisfying and true mouth feel. And um, we, after that, we simulate the uh, structure of meat. So first, um, we create the fibers that resembles those found in meat, and then we bundle them together through the process, uh, our um, full cup technology process. Finally, we use the fermentation to combine these uh, fibers to create a meal-like texture. So through this um, process, we create a realistic meal-like experience. So as you can see this image, um, right-hand side is a remit product that we are currently selling. Um, remit represents tearing textures with fiber structure using only uh, mushroom and vegetable proteins. And this brings a new level of authenticity to meat alternative. And um, this plant-based whole cut we created is highly versatile and it can be used in a various cooking situations. So from stewing, soup to grill and pan frying, it can be used just like a meat, um, liver meat. And we, pondered the best application to enter the market with this new type of meats in which people can enjoy this innovative food. So we are uh, we come um, uh, coming up with the um, uh, fried chicken. So we released meat, we made fried, 100% plant-based chicken made from mushroom. And our product boasts a high protein and fiber contents with less fat and zero cholesterol offering a nutritious and guilt-free option for those who love the taste of the fried chicken. So as a POC, uh, we had a blind test with other uh, existing TBP-based chicken product 
at food police in South Korea in 2021 with around um, 20 professionals in food industry. And we meet got higher ratings in all evaluation areas than existing uh, TBP based products. And we uh, started to sell um, um, through the online since uh, August 2021. And the product has received overwhelmingly positive feedback with more than 1,000 customers sharing their enjoyment of the uh, product uh, through the reviews. Next. Um, furthermore, women has been approached by FMB offering um, establishments, including local breweries, restaurants, and so on. And so currently, uh, we may expand the reach and can now be um, enjoyed from Seoul to Busan, Mokpo, even Jeju across the uh, country. And um, Starting from this year, Remit is expanding globally. So um, this February, we proceeded the first export to Australia and plan to export to the States this year. And furthermore, we are trying to tap into global market by participating in global competitions such as um, BIFC, um, um, hosted by Big Idea Ventures. And also we participated in the uh, FTIC conducted by Temasek Singapore and currently undergoing the program. Uh, Women is actually a very young company. We started in 2021, a two years old company. However, with its fast um, pace and execution, Women aims to become a global player in our alternative haircut category by 2025. And ultimately, Women aims to become a new type of meat besides cow, pig, and chicken. Um, so, as a Last slide, uh, once upon a time, um, a wagon with the horse used to be the way of transportation. Likewise, we will aspire to a world where the livestock used to be uh, meats. So today we may keep going on its way uh, to be a new standard meat for tomorrow. Thank you for listening to my presentation. Thank you to you. Uh, um, that was a very nice uh, presentation. Uh, yeah, indeed, your work at uh, yeah, technology seems to, to help having a great texture and density. So um, these are very important parameters for plant-based product and very challenging. Um, so thanks, uh, Ans, for this uh, presentation. Um, we will now jump to the dairy part. I see there is some question. Um, yeah, maybe we can go for one or two and uh, then we can we can jump to the, the next presentation. Um, so someone is wondering, uh, is your product uh, a breed of plant-based and mycelium? Oh, yes. Yes, for now it is a hybrid bit, uh, of the plant uh, protein materials and uh, fungi based material. Okay, great. Thank you. Uh, I hope this is uh, answering. And um, how is your product stored and packed? Um, so uh, currently it is uh, distributed in a frozen condition. So the store um, duration is around one year. And, and packing is, yeah, mostly a uh, plastic bag in a, um, yeah, in a plastic bag. But I mean, we are trying to minimize the use of the plastic. Um, yeah, so it's very simple packaging. Okay, great, thank you. Uh, and last question, and then we will, we will go for the next uh, presentation. Uh, yeah, the last mm -hmm. question is, What's your strategy uh, for securing cultural meat technology? Oh, that's a very good question. So actually, um, so regarding culturing, um, fungi and mycelium also re related to uh, culturing technology. Um, 
So here we will um, uh, obtain some aspect of the technology related to cultured meat um, product. So uh, in the future, not for now, we could expand to that area. So maybe if we are um, diving into the um, liquid uh, state fermentation, definitely um, that um, technology and production facilities can be uh, utilized for the culture meat. Okay, thank you very much, uh, it sounds. Um, yeah, great. I, I hope uh, this was uh, answering our question. If you have further question, uh, we will have, as, as we said before, another uh, Q&A uh, session at the end of the, of the webinar. So uh, now we will jump to the dairy planet. And uh, fun, it's funny because uh, it's almost the name of the next company. Uh, which is Planet Dairy, uh, and it will be presenting by Paul Cornu. So, uh, Paul, I will give you the floor right now. Just changing the bit. It's here. So, Paul, the floor is yours. Okay, fantastic, Elise. Um... Good morning and good afternoon, uh, everyone. Um, thank you for attending this uh, this session. I would like to uh, thank Hele, Elise, and Suzanne for organizing this meeting and for giving me the opportunity to speak. And also uh, all the uh, partners that uh, you see on the slides, at the bottom of the slides, that have uh, supported us. Planet Dairy is a uh, startup that was created last year. And uh, we are on a mission to make uh, uh, dairy much more sustainable than it is today. And uh, also to make uh, sustainable dairy much more uh, accessible to, uh, to the mass market, to the mass consumers, as compared to uh, only focusing on the vegans uh, with plant-based al alternatives. So I'm going to um, present to you a bit uh, what we've been doing uh, since last year in the coming uh, few slides. Um, So dairy is a big, uh, it's a big market. It's a, a 850 billion euro uh, market. Plant-based is uh, quite small in that uh, area. And dairy is a uh, quite significantly challenged from a sustainability point of view. There are lots of initiatives that are happening in uh, farming, in supply chain to help uh, reduce CO2. But these changes uh, take time. And, uh, and obviously, uh, there are there are very uh, small changes that that will take some time, uh, and there are some targets that are uh, where the dairy industry is committing to be carbon neutral by 2050 uh, or so. So, um, if you take dairy, if dairy were a country, it would be as big as the U.S. in terms of CO2 emissions. Uh, it would be the second biggest market to uh, to make CO2s. So it's really a challenge for that uh, for that industry uh, somehow, and in particular, cheese is one a key contributor, is second to uh, to beef in terms of CO2 uh, emission. So we have decided at Planet Dairy to start with cheese because this is where we can make the the biggest contribution to uh, to making dairy more uh, more accessible and more sustainable as well. Now the market is ready; people want to change. Uh, if you ask uh, customers, uh, uh, professionals in the kitchens, if you ask the consumers in the streets, they want to change their diets more and more to be more sustainable, to be uh, less CO2 uh, contributing. Um, but today, if you ask the dairy consumer, they don't want to change to plant-based alternatives. Uh, and, and that is for various reasons, uh, reasons of taste, reasons of uh, lack of nutrition, um, uh, the cheese doesn't melt or uh, the, the functionality is not the same, the texture is very different. And on top of it, the price could be uh, really, uh, really big. So um, there are some, uh, some, some big challenges and that's why today the dairy alternative market is still very small, um, except the drinks um, uh, that can represent, depending on the markets, uh, 5, 10, 15% of the of the market share for the drinks are uh, plant-based alternatives, uh, but it's still very small. Um, if you take cheese, it's it's less than a percent. 
uh, even though you have some uh, major brands and uh, uh, global brands in in this category it is it is still very small for these uh, for these reasons so so the challenge is how do we make the mass consumers really change to, uh, to their diets and uh, and to a more sustainable uh, dairy uh, offering uh, that would attract the mass consumers and not uh, and not just uh, the vegans and uh, we have taken uh, uh, this question as a as a key core of uh, what we are doing at uh, planet dairy and we are thinking that uh, the hybrid uh, approach is uh, probably a good way to achieve real sustainable dairy in in the long run so the idea of the hybrid if uh, if you are not aware of what what this is is basically you take a um, dairy product, so uh, on, on the left-hand side, a dairy product de uh, delivers on taste, delivers on nutrition, and again, uh, as said, uh, is challenged on the, on, the, on the sustainability aspects. The plant-based products is challenged on the taste and nutrition, uh, but delivers on the, on the planet or, or on sustainability. And the hybrid is, to, is taking the best of both is to say, how can I leverage the taste, the nutrition, and the uh, sustainability characteristics of both dairy and plant-based to make a product that will deliver the three uh, components that are interesting uh, to consumers and to customers. And sustainable, uh, sustainable dairy becomes then the ability to uh, deliver a product that would fit, that would sit in the dairy category, that would deliver on taste, that would deliver on nutrition, on functionality, on sustainability, and we should not forget on cost. We want the dairy products to be as affordable as, as the dairy uh, products uh, that are on the shelf uh, today, which is another criteria of importance to, uh, to consumers. So what we've done for, uh, for the last year is uh, really looking at what are the different opportunities that we have. And today, the different opportunities we have is to remove little by little the component that is coming from dairy and replace it by various ingredients. As we are starting to operate in Europe, but we want to expand to Asia as well, we, are, we can use uh, plant-based ingredients. Um, uh, Marisha was talking about precision fermentation. There are some biotech-based uh, 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 ingredients that are available as well, less in Europe than maybe in other parts of the world, but these ingredients could be used and also some side streams, some waste, that could be fermented, uh, where we could uh, uh, extract some protein, some fats, and so on. That could be also uh, used in our uh, in our dairy formulations. And what we do is we uh, create uh, again. We start with cheese, but we have the ambition to go into milk, into fresh dairy in, in general, and to create products that deliver on taste, deliver on nutrition, deliver on functionality uh, as a normal dairy product. Uh, but that would deliver minimum 40% CO2 reduction and up to 90, 95% uh, CO2 reduction, depending on the ingredients that we would select for our uh, products uh, and, and, and recipes. And we have created over, uh, over the last year, we have created a uh, two a first generation uh, cheese, uh, two shredded uh, uh, versions, one that is a mozzarella that you see uh, here, um, and another one is a cheddar uh, shredded cheese. And what we want to, uh, to make sure is that we have complete uh, uh, transparency and honesty behind the formulations and the way we make these products. So the consumer will be, when you uh, look at the package, uh, you have access to a QR code. You can scan that QR code uh, uh, with your phone and access the data that are on our, our webpage. Um, and if you still don't uh, believe this data, then you can click on the third party that is doing the evaluation for us. So these numbers that you see on the screens are not our numbers. They are validated by, by Carbon Cloud, which is a, a company in Sweden that makes uh, this type of uh, evaluation. And, and you can see how uh, the, the, the measurements and the calculations on the CO2 uh, is being done uh, by our partner. So, um, so these two cheeses, we uh, just uh, launched them a few weeks ago in Denmark. Uh, we want to expand to uh, Sweden, to Germany very quickly before the end of the year. And again, uh, we also have the ambition to go into Asia. 
expand into other cheeses, into fresh dairy, like I was saying, but still having the same ambition of delivering taste, nutrition, functionality, and a reduction of CO2 for every product that we would put on the market. Now, we have tested this uh, with the uh, municipality of Aarhus. Aarhus is the second uh, largest city in Denmark. And we had a project with the municipality to uh, get our cheeses in different canteens in, uh, in, in town. And both the kitchen professionals and the consumers who were eating the, uh, the breakfast, the lunch uh, uh, offerings of the, of the kitchen, uh, they really had a, uh, a welcoming uh, option on uh, and, and vision of our of our products with very very positive uh, feedback to uh, to what we did. So we did shredded cheese. We also did uh, a sliceable uh, cheese that is very typical to the uh, uh, eating habits of uh, the Danish people, uh, especially in the morning at, at breakfast. And, uh, and we will come uh, in the market with this cheese uh, very, very soon uh, in Denmark as well. So all in all, uh, we are just starting our commercial journey. We will bring more products in the, in the markets that will have the same ambition of making dairy more sustainable, but more sustainable and affordable to the mass consumers across the different markets we will operate uh, moving forward. So if you are interested, uh, please uh, uh, don't hesitate to uh, give me a ring or, or send me an email. Uh, I'll be happy to entertain any uh, collaborations or any questions you may have. Thank you for today and uh, have a great day. Thank you very much, Paul, for uh, your, your presentation. Uh, and uh, during the presentation, yeah, we could see again the importance of taste and nutrition for this product. Adding to a low carbon impact. Thanks for, for this introduction. Um, now, dear participants, we will uh, we will address the second masterclass, uh, which is innovative ingredients and solutions applied to the food industry, from uh, alternative to egg to the potential of uh, flaxseed and soy, for example. So, I will. Uh, give the floor um, for the second masterclass uh, to Anne Vincent, the CEO of Yumbo. So Anne, I give the control the floor is yours. Yeah. Hello, uh, everybody, and thanks a lot for uh, the invitation. So I'm Anne Vincent, I'm the co-founder of Yumgo, and uh, with Yumgo, we reinvent the egg. Uh, I'm trying to switch the slide. Um, just a moment. Yeah, just click again on the yeah. screen. Yeah. Okay. So um, we have talked a lot about uh, animal proteins today, but uh, not specifically of eggs. And uh, actually, egg is the most consumed uh, animal protein in the world. So there is egg everywhere uh, in sweet recipes, in savory recipes. And most of the time, it's, it's, uh, it's hidden uh, as an ingredient in, uh, in the recipes and in, uh, in the products that we eat. But uh, it's present really everywhere. Uh, and today uh, we have uh, discussed already a lot in uh, the presentations about the need to decrease the consumption of animal protein in general for climate reason, for uh, the uh, environment. But uh, if we look at the eggs more specifically, there are other, uh, other reasons for decreasing the consumption of eggs today. Uh, namely, uh, specifically since a year, the increase of the egg price that uh, that is uh, very important. Uh, the avian flu, the bacteria, bacteriological risk, and also uh, if you look at eggs, uh, it's an important allergen, specifically uh, among the uh, kids population. So for all these reasons, we have decided to work on egg replacement. Uh, with a focus on uh, professional uh, egg use. Because if we look at the professional use of eggs, it uh, represents 39% uh, of the egg consumption uh, under the format of uh, egg products. So it's a liquid or powder uh, whole egg, egg white or egg yolk. And uh, until now, there was no uh, simple solution to replace these formats. Uh, there was a way to replace some of the functionalities, but actually uh, it's 
uh, requires the professionals to change all the recipes. That's why we have uh, created Yomgo. Uh, so uh, with the, uh, the focus on professionals to provide a simple solution for professionals to replace eggs in all the recipes. So replace whole egg, egg white, egg yolk in a way that is uh, sustainable and delicious. Uh, we have worked on that project with, the, of course, a team. Uh, today we are a team of uh, 10 people and uh, the co-founders are Rodolphe Landman, a uh, baker in Paris. So he's the founder of uh, the bake, uh, bakery network Maison Landman in Paris and also the first uh, network of plant-based bakeries, uh, Land and Monkeys. Uh, myself with a more strategic uh, and management background uh, in consulting. And we do work with food engineers and professional chefs uh, to really uh, work with the professionals and help them to transition to more sustainable recipes. Uh, we uh, have done uh, many iterations of the product to get to res results that uh, actually replicates the properties of the egg, but uh, that is also that has uh, that uh, gives results that are as uh, delicious that the product that you could have with eggs. So we uh, our objective was really to uh, replicate the use of the eggs, so same quantity, uh, not changing the recipe, and have a visual result that is uh, identical so that the people actually do not notice that uh, they eat a neck free product. So that you can you can really touch a population that is very, very uh, large and not only uh, vegan uh, customers. Customers. So we have uh, been testing all the iterations of the product with the plant-based uh, bakeries and pastries, landed monkeys, and uh, actually all the, the products have been uh, validated by the consumers themselves. Uh, because most of the cons uh, the consumers uh, do not know actually that the product is 100% uh, plant-based when they buy it. So today we have uh, we have the a range of products that is uh, that is really meant to accelerate uh, the creation of plant based recipes and egg free recipes for for uh, the the professionals. So our product, as I mentioned already before, are ready to use. So you don't have to uh, to do anything. Uh, they are simple to use. We do have a short list of clean ingredients. So from the beginning, we have worked. Uh, uh, on uh, some requirements that was that uh, we didn't want to have a long list of ingredients. We uh, wanted to keep clean ingredients. And of course, our products are functional. So we uh, have the foaming capabilities, the, the coagulation, uh, emulsif emulsifying properties. Uh, of course, uh, we do decrease the carbon footprint with our product because that was one of the 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 important uh, goal of uh, our initiative uh, we do eliminate the allergen of egg and with our product as well something very important for uh, our professional customers we do increase the shelf life of their uh, final products by using plant-based uh, egg uh, compared to uh, animal eggs um, Next, yeah. So uh, as you can see on the screen, here uh, are just a few examples of the application that we can uh, we can uh, do with our products. But uh, actually, you can do any recipe that you would do with eggs uh, as ingredient. You can uh, do it with Yomgo products. So here you have a, a series of uh, example of uh, cakes, uh, quiche, uh, brioche, uh, macaron. Uh, but of course, you can do much more with uh, with Yomgo. Uh, and uh, the uh, the important uh, thing is that uh, the products are as delicious uh, as they could be with uh, with uh, uh, the traditional eggs. Um, so here uh, is uh, uh, just a zoom on the ingredients that we have on the powder. Uh, format of our product. So we have uh, uh, both liquid and powder formats. Uh, today we focus more on the powder because uh, in terms of uh, impact 
carbon impact uh, it's more efficient because uh, you can uh, you can you don't have to uh, keep the product refrigerated and also in terms of uh, transport and shelf life it has a lot of advantage we do focus a lot on the powder as well because we do work with industrial customers who need to have uh, uh, bigger uh, formats of the product that's why we have launched these formats uh, recently and as you can see so we have a uh, we base our product on plant-based protein uh, if you look at the Jungo Hall, it's a uh, fava bean, a rapeseed. On the white, it's a potato protein. And then on the, the uh, egg yolk uh, substitute, it's the pea protein. And uh, we have between three and uh, uh, five ingredients, which is, uh, which is very short and uh, very, very comprehensive for the, the users. Uh, we know that uh, it's a big change for the professional to to start working with the uh, egg replacement, and uh, for that reason, we do not uh, come only with a product, but we do provide as well a lot of resources, like videos uh, of recipes. Uh, we do uh, organized training, so we have a team of uh, a food engineer and professional chef that are here to work with our customers uh, on their specific needs. For example, if they have a specific recipe they need to uh, to adjust and replace the eggs we are here to support them uh, we do provide uh, advice uh, uh, advising uh, to to these customers but also we can go further and uh, work with them on the carbon in, uh, footprint of of the final product using miumco because uh, of uh, all the the work and the testing and the iterations that we have done with the the team with the customers with the pastries and bakeries and with the network of uh, chefs that we we are working with we have developed really uh, expertise in uh, plant-based uh, development of recipe so we we are really convinced that we have to uh, accompany uh, the, the 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 companies the the people that are trying to uh, to transition because it's a it's a big change and if the solution that you provide is is not simple uh, it's going to be very hard to change the mindset. And uh, today, that's, uh, we really come with the products, but also with the, the, the resources that help to, uh, to transition successfully. Uh, here, uh, I will not go into the video right now because it's. Uh, I think we, we don't have time, but uh, on our website, on YouTube as well, uh, we have a lot of uh, recipe that shows how to use the product. Actually, it's a traditional recipe if you look at them, but it's, uh, it's a way to really uh, reassure uh, the people that uh, it can be done, it's easy to do, and uh, you have good results. So a lot of uh, related to change management, actually. Um, so it's a few example of the, the video recipes that we provide. Um, so today we work mainly with uh, pastries and bakeries, with food industry, uh, food service catering. And we have uh, good uh, customers uh, in actually a, a dozen of uh, countries today, uh, in France, but also in the UK, in Japan. Uh, in uh, Germany as well, um, and uh, because we are the first range uh, to to the first company to offer a full uh, range of plant-based uh, egg replacement, we uh, do have a credibility really to uh, to accompany uh, the the these companies uh, in uh, uh, in the in the right way. Um, so here are a few pictures actually of the the recent. Uh, uh, deployment in uh, Japan, uh, also some uh, fair in uh, in the in uh, the UK, uh, in Scandinavia. So uh, for all these uh, these uh, these uh, countries, we have worked really uh, closely with the teams uh, locally to make sure that they have the right resources, that they can use the product and show uh, the results that uh, that uh, you can have with your product, so that the people understand uh, directly uh, the the endless possibilities that you have with the the Yom products to replace the eggs in uh, all applications possible. Um, we uh, work a lot as well with uh, some uh, ambassadors to uh, to uh, spread the word and uh, really uh, explain to their peers uh, how they can work with Yomgo, how it can accelerate actually their their uh, transition to plant based uh, uh, cooking or in more sustainable cooking if they if they do uh, just egg replacement. 
Um, so just to to uh, to end the presentation, uh, a look back to uh, how we started. So we have started the company in 2019, um, and we uh, have started really from the needs of Rodolphe to find solution to to replace eggs in uh, his bakeries. So we do uh, we have started with the egg white replacement, and we have uh, launched the first product, the Yumgo White in liquid format, in 2019. Uh, then we have worked on the, the egg yolk replacement in 20, uh, 2020. Uh, we have started to deploy in a few countries in the liquid format. Uh, last year, we, we have worked on the launch of the Yungo Hall in liquid. And then uh, end of the year, we have launched all the products in powder format uh, in order to reach uh, industrial customers and also to be more efficient uh, for the export of the products. Uh, as you can see on the screen as well, uh, our products have been recognized by um, a lot of uh, awards. And we are very, uh, very happy about that because uh, actually people really see the, the how it can help and how it can be a solution to facilitate the transition uh, towards the, the food of the future. Um, last week, we got the stacking door in France uh, for the Yumgo hole in powder. Uh, which is uh, actually a good recognition in France by the, the snacking uh, professionals. So we uh, we it really helps us also to to uh, to accelerate the growth of the the company. And uh, this year we do continue to work on new industrial recipes. So uh, for example, solutions that are ready uh, to use for mayonnaise or uh, pastry mix uh, that can that can really help uh, to accelerate uh, even more. Uh, the the transition to a sustainable food for the future. So that's a bit where we are today. And uh, thank you very much for your attention. Thank you to you, Anne, uh, for presenting uh, your your company. Uh, yeah, it's interesting how your whole range uh, of alternative to egg. Uh, have a lot of different benefits, uh, yeah, such as shelf life and bacteriological risks. That's a very, very interesting and yeah, a, a great solution. I think. Thanks for this presentation. Thank you. Um, just before to to continue, um, I will just. I'd uh, like to, to let you know that uh, there is some question in the uh, Q&A box. So as the time is running, uh, maybe um, speakers can directly uh, answer you uh, on the, in the Q&A uh, box. Uh, yeah, it's just um, on, the, on the top of your screen. Uh, you should uh, you should see it. You can uh, answer it directly uh, in this uh, in this box. Um, so we will now continue uh, with a company from Japan. Uh, so I would like to uh, introduce you, uh, Mrs. Uh, Wakananita, uh, and she will present our company uh, Tentu. So uh, I will just give you the control. Uh, yeah, Mrs. Nita, the floor is yours. Uh, you can you can go. Yeah. Yes, I'm trying now. Okay. Yeah. Uh, hello, nice to meet you. My name is Wakana Nita from Tensu. Uh, thank you for introducing me, Elisa. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so I am so glad to have this opportunity to speak to you today. Uh, I'd like to introduce our company and the products from the view of plant-based protein and a commitment to sustainable development goals, SDGs, which is the ideal answer to the food challenges. So let me begin by introducing ourselves. Our company started as a talk shop um, Hey, sorry. Uh, our company started as a talk shop that has been in business for over 100 years. Now we are manufacturer of Okara biscuits. Okara is a keyword in this presentation. 
I want to discuss about what OCARA is and uh, how it connects to the SDGs. So first of all, um, does anyone know what is, what is OCARA? Maybe very less people who knows about it. Then how about tofu? Probably many of you know this one. It is soft and white soya bean product that is already famous as a source of plant-based protein. Have you ever eaten tofu? I eat it on a daily basis, but I was impressed by the many different cultural recipes of tofu when I lived abroad, such as tofu burger, tofu curry, and tofu pasta. Well, the reason I ask about tofu is because okara is soya bean pulp that is produced when making tofu. To make this clear, let me start by explaining how tofu is made. To make tofu, first the soya beans are soaked, blended into a paste, and boiled. The boiled Soya paste is then squeezed and separated into a liquid and pulp. The liquid is soya bean, uh, no, sorry, soya milk, and uh, the pulp are okara. To this soya milk are beaten in added and uh, placed into a mold to harden, thus completing the tofu. Although squid of liquid, okara is originally soya bean. In this state, they have high fiber, protein, calcium, carbon hydrate, vitamins, and minerals. Another essential characteristic is low energy. So now you get to know why I chose Okara for this presentation, presentation keyword. Next, I want to explain how we use Okara to contribute to SDGs. In Japan, okara is eaten as food, but tofu is more popular. So most of okara is used as animal feed. It is also used as a fertilizer and biofuel, but not all, not all of it is reused. Some okara is still disposed of. Why is that? The reading causes a uh, short shelf life and high transport cost. Okara is very short shelf life, only two or three days after production. But most, to most tofu producers do not have the te re reprocessing technology in house. Therefore, they must be transported elsewhere for reprocessing, though transporting them is not easy either because transport conditions such as the need for refrigeration and heavy weight makes the cost higher. For this reason, okara, an um, excellent edible food, is disposed of as waste at a price. Tofu is now available in ordinary supermarket worldwide, but in few countries, okara is sold as food. Is it most common use of okara in Europe to make animal feed too, or it is prob probably uh, disposed of as waste? But we know how to eat okara as a food source of a plant-based protein. There are various recipes for it, such as uh, in salad, mixed into meatball, or made uh, into a cake. One of the recipe biscuits is our product. Our representative started processing the okara in house, uh, producing uh, and producing biscuits in the hope that okara somehow be reused. This is our commitment to SDGs. When developing these biscuits, the biscuits were made without any animal in. Uh, ingredients such as the dairy products or eggs and the team friendly to the human body and the environment. In addition, uh, okara that generally paid for disposing it of 
purchasing from neighbor talk shops for contribute to local revitalization and uh, sustainability. So we are still working hard to develop new products and expand our sales channels to save more okara from disposal. Last year, we started exporting our products abroad and we intend to increase, increase our production. So we have technology to process okara into healthy functional food with high added value. If anyone is interested in our products or technology, please do not hesitate to contact me by sending a message or meeting request through the Global Food Share Community online platform. So uh, uh, this concludes my speech. Thank you for your attention. Yes, sorry. <laughs> we had a <laughs> little bit of uh, with my video, but I'm back now. Uh, and yeah, I would like to to thank you, uh, uh, Mrs. Nita, for this uh, this presentation. Um, yeah, very very interesting presentation about uh, really we're using uh, soy pulp uh, for sweet without animal uh, derived ingredients. Uh, yeah, thanks uh, thanks for your presentation. Um, our last speaker uh, now is uh, Irina Gravislova, uh, so CEO of Sprout Dynamics. Uh, Irina, I will, uh, I will give you the control and the floor is yours. Thank you. Hello, everyone. Are you not tired yet? <laughs> Since I'm the last one, I guess uh, we need to make it a little bit more democratic, a little bit faster, so that uh, you could exhale. Well, I'm uh, I'm going to speak about Flexit today, and uh, Flexit is a little bit underestimated within the last at least ten years. It's not given enough attention, I believe. So I decided to correct that thing and get your attention to the fact that oops, the uh, the arrow is not working. Something, oh, yeah, okay, now it is. Thank you. And get your attention to the fact that actually flexid has more protein than the egg. I mean, in the in the pure comparison of weight. And that is a very important thing because that is making us uh, uh, a bit more open in terms of the new ingredients, right? To getting protein from flexid as well. Uh, the the, the, the product itself has many remarkable characteristics. You can see certain marketing claims on the screen. I will not go much into details, but like it's uh, it, it can have uh, pretty much any nice and positive marketing claims that you can imagine. And my, my favorite is save the ocean right in the middle because Flexit is uh, a product, a superfood with uh, the nutrition profile, which is which is a pure miracle, you know, in terms of the protein, about 20%, right? Dietary fiber, 80%. It has a remarkable amount of omega-3, which is in comparison to salmon, for example, is like nine times more than, than that in, in the fish. But there's one thing that you need to know about flexid, and that was one of the points of this presentation. Please pay attention that flexid contains cyanide, which is a very strong poison. And if you do not uh, consume it, carefully, correctly, and so on. Then it can cause uh, intoxication, which is now regulated by the EU Commission uh, by a very, very strict document in terms of food safety. The solution to this that we found in Sprout Dynamics is sprouting flexit for 100 hours, and uh, dynamic sprouting actually allows you to do that. And then when you, let's say, clean it of cyanide, then you get this uh really uh great product that you don't have limitations in terms of consumption yeah so then in this case you can consume it instead of rice or instead of salmon or something like this so we are now working on different uh, products but not like fish replacement in terms of taste and, and texture and so on but in terms of the nutrition profile you can see on the screen 
that uh, the uh, <laughs> the micronutrients, the vitamins and minerals are also uh, very vivid. You know, it's 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 a really really important uh, uh, new uh, ingredient in the food industry, I believe. In terms of fiber, I. Uh, I, I'm sure everybody knows that it's 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 a really uh, strong supply of fiber. You can see the picture comparison with rice. This this big pile of rice, it's two kilos of rice. So that two kilos of rice contains the same amount of fiber that small uh, amount of flax seeds uh, on the picture. That's a real picture. I I was there when the the team was uh, making it. So 27 percent uh, of fiber in the flax seed. It's it's a really astonishing amount. Uh, where you can use it? Well, obviously you can use it in all food service uh, uh, company served channels. And those that we have uh, marked so far are schools, universities, hospitals, and nursing homes, of course, you know, offices and so on. So basically food service companies are a very good channel for that. Come on, please next, yeah. In terms of the market size, well, right now the market size is pretty small. It's just half a billion dollars. And then we believe that by uh, making this ingredient available uh, in terms of cyanide free and so on, it can increase up to incremental 1 billion plus. Uh, how we do this, uh, I mean, in terms of sprouting the flaxseed for 100 hours, we have come up with a proprietary technology, which is AI controlled, full of sensors, uh, contains a lot of, uh, you know, knowledge in terms of botanics, in terms of engineering, food tech, and so on. So we put all the things together, introduce micro batching, and uh, we do it in a very different way versus what, what is the, how it's done today. Uh, so it's, a, it's, a, it's an innovative thing, obviously. Uh, our company is open to all sorts of collaborations. Uh, the, the point of this presentation was to just get your attention to the fact that there's much more out there that went, than we're using today. And uh, my team is very good in developing different solutions, concepts, and uh, just brainstorming and, and so on. So please feel free to reach out for uh, different, you know, maybe projects, even a chat uh, in, in developing the alternative protein industry together. So. Thank you very much. And I hope it was uh, interesting and informative. And yes, it was, uh, Irina. Uh, thank you very, very much. Uh, honestly, I didn't know uh, that um, this superfood could have a Nicole nutrition profile uh, than salmon, for example, and cheaper and more, in a more sustainable way. So super interesting and super rich uh, presentation. Thanks a lot. Um, Thank you for inviting. Yeah, it's a, a pleasure to having you, and uh, also a pleasure to to have all uh, these uh, super brilliant speakers uh, today. Uh, I would like just to, to thanks a lot to all our speakers of the day. It was a very rich uh, and interesting uh, webinar. I hope uh, you all uh, you all enjoy uh, this moment with us. Um, just would like to let you know uh, that uh, we have a, a last question uh, for all participants. I will go uh, quickly uh, on it uh, as the time is running. So as uh, a question to, to everybody was uh, for the product stored uh, frozen, do you experience any quality loss or consumer dis dissatisfaction due to crystal formation? Sorry, so, so please, please say again that the connection was not, not, not very clear for a second. All right. So for the products uh, stored for them, uh, do you experience any quality loss or consumer dissatisfaction due to crystal formation? This is a question to everyone. In, in Flaxseed, there's a we, we, we normally deal with frozen flaxseed, so there's certain deterioration of uh, characteristics, uh, but they're pretty minor, so they, they would not be a material, uh, let's say, subject to, uh, to actually 
you know, pay too much attention to that. So it's, there is certain deterioration, but it's very minor. Okay, great, thank you. Um, yeah, for, for the other question, as we are out of time, I will uh, invite you to answer uh, directly uh, in the Q&A uh, box, sure. how to send us uh, an email uh, yeah, to Suzanne and me or directly on the, the email address you, you may have uh, seen uh, during the, the webinar. Uh, and I will uh, give the floor to Suzanne, uh, my dear Suzanne, to, to, to close uh, this webinar. Yes, thank you so much. I hope you all have been inspired and learned a lot today. I certainly did. And uh, it's a whole new take on seafood, meat, flaxseed, okara is something new that I didn't exist, know existed, but also meat, of course. So I hope you will be inspired also to listen to what the consumers are saying. So I know we have some issues with the taste, nutrition, functionality, cost and sustainability, but all you good companies, you are a brilliant developer. So uh, I'm sure in the future, we will see a lot more coming uh, our way to the consumers uh, and the supermarkets shelf. So just to uh, close, uh, we are out of time. Uh, I would just like to, uh, introduce you to the, our next activities. Um, as I said in the beginning, we are uh, organizing a mission to Thailand and uh, they will also be visiting a huge uh, a food fair, the Thaifex Anuga. And then the next uh, online workshop will be on 11 of May. And then we have the focus on food waste. So we get around uh, the whole uh, value change here. Um, on the 15th of June, it's about fermentation, which is also a very hot topic within uh, the food uh, industry. And uh, again, uh, we have an international training session coming up on South Korea. So just stay tuned uh, for our website, uh, Global Future. Uh, I think you all know it by now, but otherwise, please don't hesitate to contact you. So for now, just to say thank you and thank you for your active participation. And uh, as I said, visit the Global Future Community Platform and see you hopefully the next time. So goodbye from us and uh, have a nice day.